All right, let's try this problem. Well, we're trying to figure out the molar mass, so our units are grams of solute per moles of solute. And we know how many grams of solute we have. We have five. And the mole fraction of solute is equal to 0 0.06. And 0 0.06 is equal to moles of solute over moles of solute plus moles of solvent. And we know how many moles of solvent we have. We have 20 moles. So we cross multiply and we get one mole of solute is equal to 0 0.06 times mole of solute plus 20. You distribute that and one mole of solute is equal to 0 0.06 mole of solute plus 1.2 subtract 0 0.06 moles of solute We get 0.94 mole of solute is equal to 1.2 by 1.2 by 0.94. And moles of solute is equal to 1.27. So five grams divided by 1.27. is equal to 3.92 grams of solute per, mo per mole of solute. All right, good. That was a good process. These numbers that I picked don't seem very realistic because this is a really low molar mass. Uh, but anyway, that's the right uh, process for solving that. Okay, good. So that was the skill we were going over at the end of the last session. So that's good that you remember that. So let's move on to some new stuff. Whoops. All right. One second. Let's see here.
Okay, I think this problem will work. Uh, try working this out on paper. Tell me what you're writing down. Well, we're trying to figure out grams of solute per mole of solute. Hey, you already know how many grams we have. We have six grams of solute. Vapor pressure of pure water to temperature 35 door, vapor pressure of solution is 30 tor so then we would have to use x solvent is equal to sorry whoops i meant to say p solvent is equal to x solvent times P naught and we know that the P solvent is 35 tor that is equal to X solvent times oops it should be 30 tor and then P solvent is 35 tor Divide by 35 tor. So 30 divided by 35 tor. And X solvent is equal to 0 0.857. So if you subtract this number from 1, That'll give you 0 0.14. And that's X solute. So then we'll take this number, 0 0.14. And that is equal to um, moles of solute over moles of solute plus moles of solvent I know how many well we can figure out how many moles of solvent we have by taking 90 grams of water and we divide that by 18 grams of water for one mole And we get five moles of water. cross multiply and then we'll get one mole solute is equal to 0 0.14 times moles of solute plus 5 and we distribute that And then that 
would be plus 0 0.71. Subtract this molar solute on both sides. A step from one, and then we'll get and that is equal to zero point seven one. Divide this number. And that is the most solute then. It's equal to 0 0.83. And then we just take 6 grams of solute. We divide that by 0 0.83 moles of solute. That is equal to 7.19 grams of solute per mole of solute. Let's see, how many moles of solute did you get? I got 0 0.83. I took one mole and then I subtracted 0 0.14. But I kept all of my significant figures, so I got a bigger number. Um, so you got 0.86. So what number did you have here? Um, well, the one that I got was 0 0.8333 3, repeating and then 6. And the calculation was 1 minus 0.14? 1 minus 0.14285714294. Um, and tell me again the number you got here. 0 0.857. Oh, okay. it, it sounds like there's just uh, some disagreement about the rounding then. Okay. So uh, let's see. I got 0 0.86. So then I have 0 0.7 divided by 0 0.86, which is about 0.814. 6 divided by 0 0.814. So I would get 7.37 here and you got 7.19 yes yeah it sounds like that's just rounding error okay good uh so that was good so this is i think uh the hardest question we've done so far on the colligative properties but i think you worked this all out uh without any hints so that's good 
Uh, now you can see why we had to take that digression about the math for mole fractions. Uh, so it's good that you were able to see how to tie that in to uh, the vapor pressure lowering here. Um, in this formula, what does this symbol stand for? Which, oh, that one is um, vapor pressure of the solvent with solutes in it. Good, good. And this stands for? That one stands for um, the vapor pressure of a pure solvent that's right. with no solutes in it. Good, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I noticed that at first you seem to be flipping these and putting the numbers in the wrong places, but you, you caught that mistake, so that's good that you caught that mistake. Also, um, it's good that you realized that the equation gave us the mole fraction of solvent, um, but it would be more useful here to know the mole fraction of the solute, since that's what the problem is about. Actually, I think you could probably solve this uh, using the mole fraction of the solvent, too, if you were careful. But maybe this was more straightforward, so it's good that you saw there was a difference between uh, those two. Uh, okay, so um, remember, what, what, what is the use of this in the lab, then? Remember that if you have an unknown solute, you can't see what its molar mass is, because you can't see the molecules. So we've already seen that colligative properties give you a way to find the molar mass. So here's an, another colligative property that gives you the way to find the molar mass. So again, I think this is about the hardest problem on this you might see on the test. Um, what, what was the hard part of finding the molar mass here? We, it's easy to measure how many grams of solute you have. You could measure how many grams you have in the lab, but you can't easily measure how many moles you have, right? Because to measure that, you'd have to be able to see the individual molecules and add them all up. So that's the hard part, figuring out how many moles you have. But you can measure how much your vapor pressure got lowered. And if you can measure that, you can figure out the mole fraction of your solute. And if you know the mole fraction of your solute, you can figure out the number of moles of solute, too. And that was the information that we needed. So colligative properties are useful in the lab because you can use them to figure out the number of moles without actually counting all the individual molecules. Okay, so let's try uh, example one here. Lost it. One gram of a non-volatile self self analamine is dissolved in ten grams of acetone. The vapor pressure of pure acetone at the same temperature is four hundred millimeters of mercury. Calculate the vapor pressure of the solution. Well, that'd be P solvent is equal to X solvent times P naught of solvent. Now we know that P solvent is equal to 400 millimeters of mercury. And we have to figure out X solvent, which is the moles of solvent over moles of solute plus moles of solvent. So if we have 10 grams of acetone, And that's 12 times 3 is 36, plus 6, plus 16. Divide that by 58 grams of acetone for one mole. And that is equal to 0 0.17 moles. A 
acetone. And then we can take one gram of sulfanilamide. Let me take 12 times 6 plus 8 plus 32 plus 28 plus 32. You get 172 grams per mole. So divide one by 172 grams. And that is equal to 0 0.0058 grams or moles, excuse me. And add this to point one seven two four one and our total number of moles is equal to A mole fraction is zero point nine six seven. And then multiply this by four hundred and P solvent. is equal to 386.95, so 397 um, millimeters of mercury. So you have an answer? Yeah, 387 millimeters of mercury. Okay, um, so that was a good process. Uh, the only thing I didn't hear you talk uh, say is it's al it's always good at the start to write down the symbol for what the question's asking. What would have been a good symbol for what this question's asking? P solvent. P solvent or P not solvent. P solvent. That's right. So that would be a good thing to have started with. Also, something that we haven't been talking about, but it would have been good here if we could have gotten a prediction. What could we predict about the answer here from the start? We could say that it's probably a regular number. You mean an ordinary size number? or? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. That's one. Uh, that would be one good prediction. Something else that we can do is we can predict whether it's going to be bigger or smaller than 400. Which would you have predict? It's going to be smaller because we added a non-volatile solute. That's right. That might seem obvious, but it's good to try to get even just a, a vague prediction like that to make sure that you're applying intuition to the problem. And our answer did come out to match that. Well, this was a, a, a good method. Um, you, uh, you had to put a lot of different things together. You used your stoichiometry and the mole fraction, and you put that into the formula. So... That was a good method, and I think you got the right answer, 387 millimeters of mercury. That's good.
Now let's try example two. Calculating the molecular mass formula weight of a solute. Five grams of a non-volatile compound was dissolved in 100 grams of water at 30 degrees C. The vapor pressure of the solution was measured and found to be 31.2 torr. The vapor pressure of pure water at 30 degrees C is 31.82 torr. Calculate the molecular mass of the unknown solute. So they're asking for grams of solute per mole of solute. And we already know five grams. So first we have to use P solvent is equal to X solvent times P naught of solvent. And let's see. P solvent is 31.20 torr. And that is equal to X solvent times 31.82 torr. Because that's. Yeah. That's for pure water and then divide 31.20 by 31.82 and X solvent is equal to 0 0.9805 so 0 0.98 and if you subtract this number from 1 That'll give you point zero one nine. Now that's the X solute, so we know that This number, 0 0.019, is equal to X solute. Sorry, not X solute, mole of solute. Divided by mole of solute plus mole of solvent. Cross multiply. Then we get one mole of solute is equal to 0 0.019. mole of solute plus actually yeah 0 0.019 times mole of solute and we already have well we don't have the moles of solvent but we can figure it out because we just take 100 grams of water and divide it by 18 grams for one, per one mole and that gives you 5.55 Five point five five moles. Now we can just distribute this number. So we get one mole of solute equal to 0 0.019 moles of solute and then subtract this 0 0.019 on both sides
and that is equal to 0 0.9805 and divide this number on both sides And then moles of solute is equal to 0 take 5 divided by this number we get 45.3 grams per mole grams of solute per mole of solute and that's my final answer repeat that number again my final answer is 45.3 grams of solute per mole of solute Okay, good. I got a slightly different answer because I rounded it a little different, but I think that's correct. Okay, there's a lot of steps to that, but I think you went through all of those uh, just right. Um, now, one thing I'm a little unclear clear about, notice the question here was asking for the molecular mass. What are the units for molecular mass? AMUs. Oh. Yeah, AMUs. Right. So then so what should the answer be? It should actually be 45.3 AMUs. I think so, yeah. I don't know if people are always consistent about that, but molecular mass sounds like the mass of one molecule, so it seems like that should be an AMUs. On the other hand, that's not the way they actually wrote it here. Uh, in this particular handout, they wrote it as grams per mole, but I don't think that actually is quite right. Um, since since they're asking for molecular mass, they want the mass of one molecule. It's like the molecular weight. So I think it would be better to put AMUs. Maybe your instructor wouldn't be too picky about that, but those are really two different things. Oh, so anyway, the point is, what you would have done here is first you would, uh, even if you're doing this, it's still good to find the molar mass first. We find the molar mass first, and then we know if this is the molar mass, then this is the molecular mass, which is actually the answer. We would still do this first. Okay. Oh, and uh, looking at this handout, that reminds me of something that maybe I should have mentioned. This rule here is called uh, Raoul's Law. Raoul's Law. For vapor, so vapor pressure lowering, lowering goes with Raoul's Law. Um, notice here they mentioned that it was non-volatile. But that doesn't affect how we solve the problem. I think I mentioned to you last time that all of these approaches we've been covering, they've all been assuming non-volatile compounds, compounds that don't evaporate easily. So that doesn't change how we're going to solve this. Um, one other thing, uh, remember we've been talking about uh, colligative properties. Remember, what does colligative mean? It means that all that matters is the number of moles of dissolved particles, not the identity of the particles. But remember we saw when we were talking about vapor, uh, I mean boiling point elevation and freezing point depression, that ionic substances can break apart and so they can form more particles than the number of moles of solute. It seems to me like that would apply here too. 
So for example, if we were using sodium chloride, if you put in three moles of sodium chloride, when you're calculating the mole fractions, um, you should probably actually um, put in six moles since it breaks about apart into two uh, particles each. So if you were using an ionic compound here, if you were putting in three moles of sodium chloride, I think you would have to put in six moles of solute particles. Um, I didn't see any questions that dealt with that in the, in the files that you sent me. Maybe, maybe that's not tested so much for, for vapor pressure lowering, but in case you see that on the test, I, I guess that's worth uh, mentioning. All these problems we've been doing so far, I guess you're just supposed to assume that they're non-ionic. Generally, um, if, if you're not given the information, I suppose you're supposed to assume that something is a non-electrolyte um, if, if that's necessary to solve the problem. So that's what you've been assuming. Um, also, I wanted to mention, notice that the mole fraction of the solvent here is very large, and the mole fraction of the solute is very small, right? Less than 2% of the moles come from solute. I just wanted to point out that's pretty normal, right? Because the solvent usually have way, way more of the solvent than the solute, unless it's a very concentrated uh, solution. So it's not surprising that we got extreme numbers like this. All right, I think that, that basically covers the questions you might see on uh, vapor pressure lowering. I think you made good progress on that. This, uh, we, this was a pretty hard question. You got that right. So let's move on to our next topic. Okay, uh, so let's see here. So here we have what's called a U-shaped tube. There's water on both sides of the tube. Um, and the two sides of the tube are separated by what's called a, a semi-permeable membrane. And on the right side of the membrane, we have pure water. And on the left side, we have water with a solute dissolved in it. Um, do you know what semi-permeable means? That means some things can go through the membrane and some can't. So in this case, let's say it's permeable to water, but not to the solute. Water can move through this, but not the solute. Permeable to water, not permeable to the solute. That's the type of membrane we'll be thinking about in all the examples that we're working on now. Now what's going to be happening here is that sometimes water molecules will accidentally bump into the membrane and move from the right compartment into the left compartment. And sometimes water molecules will accidentally bump into the membrane from the left and they'll move from the left compartment into the right compartment. So water is going to be moving in both directions. It basically depends on how often the water molecules hit the membrane. The more often they hit the membrane from each side, the more often they're going to move to each side. Um, but which side here is going to have more water molecules that are right next to the membrane? Which side will have more water molecules that are right up next to the membrane? The right. Why are there fewer water molecules next to the membrane on the left? Because there's solutes present. Right. So the solute basically gets in the way. Some of the spaces near the membrane that the water molecules might take, the solute will take instead. So 
is the water going to be moving more from left to right or more from right to left? More from right to left. We can show that with these arrows. There's a lot of water moving from right to left. There's also water moving from left to right, but the water hits the membrane from the left less often because um, the solute particles get in the way. So what's going to happen over time to our picture? Well, it'll look like this. Which side of the U-shaped tube is the water level going to rise on? It's going to rise on the left. So we might end up... One, two, three, four. Good. So we're going to end up with something that looks like this. Now, can this process go on forever? Can the water just keep leaving the, the right-hand comp compartment forever? It can't go on forever because there's going to be a counteracting pressure going the other way. Notice now that there's a higher hydrostatic pressure on the left because of this extra, this extra water on the left here is going to be pushing down more strongly than the water on the right. So on the one hand, we have um, the fact that there's more solutes here pulling the water to the left. On the other hand, we have the greater hydrostatic pressure that's pushing to the right. Eventually, those two things are going to cancel out. Eventually, they'll cancel out and we'll be in equilibrium where the two sides are equal. How much pressure does it take to get to equilibrium? That's what's called um, the osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure is how much extra hydrostatic pressure we need here to prevent the water from flowing. The osmotic pressure is how much extra pressure, how much extra hydrostatic pressure we need on the left to keep the water from flowing from right to left. Um, and uh, by the way, so what do we call it when water, um, so notice where does water tend to move? Does water tend to move to where there's lots of solutes or few solutes? To where there's lots of solutes? Yes. So the slogan I like is, does water leave solutes or does water follow solutes? It follows them. Water follows solutes. This is a really useful idea in uh, biology and biochemistry as well. Water follows solutes. That's just worth memorizing. We explained why that is um, because more water can move to where there's solutes. The, it's hard for water to escape where there's solutes because the solutes get in the way. But it's easy for the water to leave here because there's nothing but water. So water follows solutes. Do you remember what, do you know what the name of that process is where water moves to where there's more solutes? That's called osmosis. When water moves through this semi-permeable membrane to where there's more solutes, that's what's called osmosis. The movement of water through the semi-permeable membrane to where there's more solute concentration, that's osmosis. That's why I said that the extra pressure that's required to stop osmosis is osmotic pressure. The extra hydrostatic pressure that's required to stop osmosis, that's osmotic pressure. I think here's, here's a simpler way to think about it, though. Let's go back to the original picture. Now, back here in this original picture, which way on net does the water want to flow? It wants to flow to the left. Let's say that we want to stop that. We could stop that by putting a piston, a solid piston over here, and pushing down on the piston. If we push hard enough on the piston, that'll prevent any water from moving in here. But we're going to have to exert some pressure on that piston. And the pressure that we have to put on the piston to stop the water from flowing that's also the osmotic pressure. So, osmotic pressure is the pressure required to osmotic pressure uh, 
of a solution is the pressure required to stop osmosis into that solution. It's the pressure you would have to push down on this piston with to stop osmosis into that solution. Um, so let's give a symbol for osmotic pressure. Um, the symbol for osmotic pressure is pi. That's our symbol for osmotic pressure. Um, normally we, we, we give pressure as P, right? We were using P for vapor pressure before, but for osmotic pressure the convention is to use pi. That's logical because, because pi is the Greek letter for P. What do you think would be uh, common units for osmotic pressure? Or in millimeters of mercury. That's right. And what would be another common unit, perhaps? Atmospheres. The same units that for pressure that we were using before. So we're still working with this idea of pressure now. Um, so we could also have, yeah, Torricelli's or uh, atmospheres. That's right. Or millimeters of mercury. Okay. Um, what would happen if we put more solutes in here? Would the water want to get in more, or would the water want to get in less? If we added more solutes to this compartment like this, would that suck in more water or less water? It would suck in more water. And again, the reason is it's still just as easy for water to move from right to left, but now it would be even harder for water to move from left to right, because there's even more solute particles to get in the way. Uh, good. So, if we add more solute particles here, what do you think that's going to do to the osmotic pressure? It's going to increase it. Because if we add more solute particles, it'll take even more pressure than before to stop osmosis. If we add more solute particles, it'll take even more pressure than before to stop osmosis. So, let's say that uh, we increase the molarity. of the solute. What's the symbol for molarity? Capital M. What do you think would be the effect of that on osmotic pressure? It'll increase it. Because we were just saying more solute pulls more water in, so it would take more pressure to prevent that osmosis. So if we were trying to get an equation for osmotic pressure, should molarity go on the top or the bottom of the fraction? If you were trying to get... Could you repeat that? If we're making an equation that makes sense for osmotic pressure, should I put molarity on the top of this fraction or the bottom of the fraction to match up with this pattern that we just predicted? We said that molarity and pressure should move in the same direction. This should be on the top. So they'll move in the same direction. This again is why this is another colligative property. Um, because um, if the osmotic pressure depends on the molarity, then it depends on the number of moles of solute particles. And again, it turns out all that matters is the number of particles. It doesn't matter what the identity of the particles are. Uh, now the rest of the equation turns out to be this. It just so happens that the rest of the equation for osmotic pressure is like this. So let's review that. Uh, what is this the symbol for? Osmotic pressure. Good. And how about this? Molarity. Yeah. Now, this is the molarity of the solute, not the molarity of the solvent. We don't usually think about the molarity of the solvent. This is the molarity of the solute. Do you know what this symbol stands for? I guess that's the ideal gas constant. You're right. That's right. Uh, you and I haven't worked with that much yet in this chemistry class, but here's we're, we're using the ideal gas constant, capital R. Um, do you have your textbook with you? Can you look up what that number is? Ideal gas constant. It's uh, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And is there another number they get for that? I'm sorry? Good. Is there another numerical value that your textbook gives for that? Uh, I don't see one. Okay. What, what, are you looking at the inside cover? 
No, I just pulled it up off the internet. <laughs> okay, that's fair too. All right. Um, if you had your textbook with you and you looked at, there should be a table of content, a uh, table of um, constants in the textbook. Usually they give two different numbers. The number we need is this one. This is the constant you'll probably be using at this point in the course and for most of your chemistry course. Okay. Um, good. Well, when you're ready, what do you think does this symbol stand for? I guess that would be temperature in Kelvin. That's right. That's good that you mentioned that it has to be in Kelvins. Um, could you put in the temperature in Celsius? No, because then it wouldn't match up with this constant, right? Notice this constant is in Kelvins. Um, that's a very common trap on these problems. It's important to always put things in kelvins. Um, and then what units would we be using for this symbol? Osmotic pressure would be, um, I guess, atmospheres. In order to be consistent with R. So maybe we're not going to use Torricelli too much here, at least not directly, because then it wouldn't be consistent with R. We need to use atmospheres to be consistent with our value for R. Um, Good. And notice that this really has molarity in it too. What, what are the what are the units for molarity? What does molarity break down into? That's moles over liters. Good. Moles of what over liters of what? Uh, moles of solute over liters of solution. That's right. Good. And notice that that's kind of built in here too. Moles over liters, except it's in the denominator. By the way, now you can uh, kind of see why we can't use the other value that you picked up. You picked up the value from the internet uh, 8.3, but if they gave you units for that, that was in um, joules, that's in SI units, so that wouldn't match up with liters and atmospheres. That other value you were giving uh, was for SI units, but these are actually not SI units. Um, these are the units that are more common in chemistry. The value you saw was more common in physics. Okay, so here's our formula. Oh, and uh, then we have to add something else. Remember that what matters is the number of solute particles but some substances break up into more than one particle. So we have to do the same thing as before and add the Van't Hoff factor. So it's going to also put I here to add the Van't Hoff factor. Uh, okay, so then I think this will be our final formula. So I think you should memorize uh, this for the test. Okay, so let's see here. Oops. So, if you have a concentrated solution, will it have a high or a low osmotic pressure? Does it it's going to have a high osmotic pressure. That's right. Good. Uh, and if you have a dilute solution, what type of osmotic pressure does that have? Could you repeat that? If you have a dilute solution, what's, what do you know about its osmotic pressure? It's going to be low. Yeah. So, notice osmotic pressure is kind of an indirect way of measuring concentration. It's kind of like molarity or molality. Just like high molarity or high molality indicate a concentrated solution, a high osmotic pressure also indicates a concentrated solution. So let's say we have two compartments here separated by another semi-permeable membrane that only lets through the water. Um, which of these two compartments has a higher concentration of solute?
Are you there? Yes. I'm sorry. So um, if this compartment has the higher osmotic pressure and this has the lower osmotic pressure, which of the two compartments has the higher concentration of solute? It's the left. Yeah, this is more concentrated. So which way will the water tend to move on net? Will water be moving towards the right or towards the left? Towards the left. Because water follows solutes. Water follows solutes. Remember, there's fewer solute particles to get in the way of the water crossing the membrane from the right. There's more solute particles to get in the way of the water crossing the membrane from the left. So the water will move in this direction. Good. So over time, um, the, uh, the, these two sides would change in size. Uh, all right. So, um, so notice water moves towards the higher osmotic pressure. Water moves towards the higher osmotic pressure. Um, a slogan I've sometimes heard to remember that is... This. Osmotic pressure sucks. Uh, just as a memory aid, what does it suck? The water. Yeah. It sucks the water from the right side to the left side. So osmotic pressure sucks water into that compartment. It doesn't suck the solutes in. It sucks the water in. All right, good. All right, so um, that might help us here. So some other terms. Have you heard the terms hypertonic and hypotonic and isotonic? Those come up sometimes in biology. Yeah. Do you know which side here is the hypertonic side? The left. Because hyper means a lot, and this has a lot of solutes. And what would we call this side? The hypotonic. That's right. Because hypo means low or beneath. Like a hypodermic needle goes beneath your skin, or hypothermia is when you have low temperature. So hypotonic, this is so hypotonic means low osmotic pressure. These shouldn't be too hard to remember because hypo means low and hyper means high. Hypertonic means high osmotic pressure. Hypotonic means low osmotic pressure. What's the term when two compartments have equal osmotic pressure? Do you know what we call it when two compartments have equal osmotic pressure? Isotonic. That's right. Because iso means the same, like an isosceles triangle has two equal sides. Okay, so does water flow towards hypertonic areas or hypotonic? When water flows to hypertonic areas. Think about a body cell. If you take a body cell and you put it in a uh, extracellular fluid that's hypertonic to it, which way will the water flow? So outside Out the, the cell. cell. That's right. So what's going to happen to the size of the cell? It's going to decrease. Right. It'll shrivel up like this. Uh, and that can kill the cell. So you can kill a cell by putting it in a hypertonic solution because it shrivels up. All the water leaves it. What happens if you put the cell in a hypotonic solution, so the outside of the cell is hypotonic? It's going to swell up. The cell will swell up um, because water uh, will move to where there's more solutes. Um, and uh, th if this keeps continuing and the, they don't get to be isotonic, eventually the cell is going to burst. The cell will swell and maybe burst, and of course that would... Uh, kill the cell as well. So if you want the cell to live and be healthy, what type of environment should you put it in? An isotonic. That's right. Cells have to exist in an isotonic environment. Otherwise, uh, they get killed. So one example of that is, for example, if someone is um, being given an IV solution, 
um, what should the IV solution be relative to their cells, hypertonic or hypotonic or isotonic? Isotonic. Yeah, when you keep people on IV, it's got to be isotonic to their own cells or it can kill the cells. Um, good. Let's say that you put a cucumber in concentrated salt water. What would happen to the water? What would happen then if the cucumber is in concentrated salt water? So there's water outside, and of course there's some water inside the cucumber. The cucumber is going to shrivel up. Because the water will move in this direction. That's right. Do you know what the water is called? I mean, sorry, do you know what you call it, what you make from that? Pickles. Okay, that's good. That's right. So that's a way to make uh, a pickle. Um, by shriveling it, by putting it in this hypertonic um, solution. One other example that might possibly uh, come up. How do you preserve meat? The reason that meat rots is you that the bacteria... salt eat. it. That's right. So if you salt it, why does putting salt on the meat kill the bacteria? Because since it's since bacteria are basically isotonic on the meat and since you're adding salt you're increasing the the meat the environment to be hypertonic that way the water will flow out and they'll shrivel up and die that's right the water will move this way and the bacteria will shrivel up uh, and die so that was especially important before there was refrigeration um, this was an alternative way to, to kill the bacteria all right um, so those are good real life examples and it wouldn't be too hard to write a test problem that involved uh, some of those but it looks like you're pretty comfortable with that so let's look at a numerical example um, All right, let's try this. Well, osmotic pressure is pi is equal to IMRT. We have I, which is equal to 2, M, which is equal to 0.5 molarity. Um, R is equal to 0 0.082 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin. And temperature is Kelvin, but since we have degrees, it's 25 plus 273.15, which is equal to 298.15. And then just multiply that, so 2 times point. Uh, osmotic pressure is equal to 24.45 atmospheres. What does that mean? Well, remember that normal atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So it means, remember, that if you were pushing down on that piston to prevent osmosis from happening, you would have to push down with about 24 times atmospheric pressure to prevent uh, osmosis from happening. Okay, good, great. Um, one thing that would be good to be a little bit more systematic would be to start by writing down the symbol for what they're asking us. In this case, this would be the symbol, but this was a good method. It's good that you saw that we had to plug in 2 for I because the sodium chloride um, is going to split up. All right, that's good.
Let's work this out. Well, they're asking for molarity, which is capital M. And we know pi is equal to IMRT, where pi is equal to 7.7 .7 atmospheres, which is equal to 1 times M times 0 0.082 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin times 298.15 Kelvin. So then we multiply 0 0.082 times 298.15. Take 7.7 .7 divided that by this number. We get 0.314. 0.315 and what concentration well it would have to be that molality so 0 0.315 molar glucose that molarity right okay and you started by writing down the symbol for what the question's asking that's good by the way um, remember when we're working with so when we're working with boiling point elevation, what measure of concentration do we use for boiling point elevation in the formula? We use um, molality. Molality. And how about for freezing point depression? The same. That's right. How about for vapor pressure lowering? How do we measure the concentration? Mole fraction. Mole fraction. And how about for osmotic pressure? Um, molarity. Okay, so now we've gone over three different ways of measuring concentration. Molarity, molality, and mole fraction. And a different one is used in each, uh, in uh, a bunch of these different formulas. So it's important to, I guess you have to memorize all those for the exam. So that's something uh, to work on memorizing. Um, okay, so notice uh, this was an example of how the term isotonic could come up on the exam. And I guess this example here, um, uh, this is the kind of calculation you would do, again, if you were maybe trying to, to, to uh, give an IV fluid. If you're trying to get an IV fluid that would be isotonic to the blood, this is the kind of, con uh, the kind of calculation uh, that you would be doing. How did you know that I was one? Because uh, we're not dealing with any electrolytes. Yeah. How do you know? Who are, what are we dealing with? Uh, glucose. Yeah, and glucose we know is covalent. That's not going to uh, break up. Good. Here's another problem. Let's try this. Isotonic saline. Isotonic saline solution, which has the same osmotic pressure as blood, can be prepared by dissolving 0.923 grams of sinicoid in an FOR to produce 100 milliliters of what is the osmotic pressure in the atmosphere of the solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, they're looking for pi, so pi is equal to I M R T. Pi is equal to 2 times oh, we are trying to figure out the molarity well we have 0 0.923 grams NaCl and NaCl weighs Twenty three plus thirty five point four five fifty eight point four five grams per one mole and that is equal to zero point zero one five seven nine moles. And divide that by 0.1 for 
100 liters. And molarity is equal to 0 0.1579. So 0 0.1579 and times 0 0.082 liters atmospheres mole Kelvin and then multiply that by 298.15 Kelvin. And the osmotic pressure is equal to 7.7 .7 atmospheres. What did you plug in for T? 298.15. What did you get for the molarity? 0 Okay, yeah, I got slightly different because of uh, rounding. But yeah, it looks like I made an arithmetic mistake at the start, but it looks like you got that right. What was your answer again? 7.7 .7 atmospheres. Atmospheres. Let's see. Yeah, so they got basically uh, the same answer uh, that you got. By the way, this notice uh, mentioned something. If you actually do this in the lab, you would get um, a slightly different answer because the real Van Hoff factor is not 2. Uh, when you actually dissolve sodium chloride, not 100% of the ions dissociate. We predict that 100% would dissociate, but in reality, some of the ions end up paired. Um, all right, so anyway, that's worth knowing. But when you're solving these problems, you should just do them using the, the theoretical prediction. So the answer that you got was correct. You did that correct. So this was just a little harder than the one before because you had to figure out the molarity. Um, but you, uh, you did that correctly. Now, let's say that we have... Point three molar solute in two liters of solution. We have grams of solute. What's the molar mass? Let's actually say we've got 300 milliliters. So I'll make a change there. Let's call that 300 milliliters of solution. What's the molar mass? Let's 
try this problem. Uh, we're looking for grams of solute per mole of solute. And we know 50 grams, so we're trying to figure out how many moles of solute. Well, since we have 0 0.3 moles per 1 liter, we can multiply this number by 0.3 liters to get to cancel the liters, and then that way we'll have 0.3 moles times 0.3 liters, and we get 0 0.09 moles of solution. Actually, sorry, not solution, um, solute. Now, since we have that number, you can just take 50 grams and divide it by 0 0.09, and we get 555 grams of solute per mole of solute. Okay, good. That was good that you worked that out. Um, good. So notice um, earlier we saw that if you know the molality of the solute, you can use that to figure out how many moles of solute you have. And then uh, we saw that if you know the mole fraction of the solute, you can use that to figure out how many moles of solute you have. So now we're seeing that if you know the um, molarity of the solute, you can also use that to figure out how many moles you have. And if you already know how many grams you have, then you can do this calculation. Remember, it's easy to measure grams. Anybody can go into the lab and uh, use a scale to measure the number of grams. It's not so easy to measure how many moles you have, because theoretically that would require counting every single molecule. But if you already know the concentration, either in molality or molarity or mole fraction, you can use arithmetic to figure out the number of moles. I think you're getting the hang of this unit conversion technique. This is a unit conversion technique we're going to use in a lot of areas of chemistry. This tells us whether we should be multiplying by 0.3 or dividing. It's good that you saw that you had to do a unit conversion from milliliters here. All right, so. Okay, let's try this. 50 grams of solute is dissolved in water to form 2 liters of solution. Osmotic pressure is 0.02 atmospheres 
25 degrees C, find a solute smaller mass. I'm over looking for grams of solute per mole of solute. And we already have 50 grams, so we're looking for the moles. And we can take, well, we don't know what kind of solute. That's a good point. Let's say that it's uh, non-ionizing. That's a good point. I should have specified that. Non-ionizing solute is dissolved in water to form two liters. And we know that pi is equal to I times MRT, where pi is 0 0.02 atmospheres. And that is equal to 1 times the molarity, which we do not know, times R, which is 0 0.082 liters atmospheres, mole Kelvin, times 298.15 Kelvin. And 0 0.02 atmospheres is equal to 24.45. Divide that to get the divide both sides by 24.45 to get the molarity. So 0 0.02 divided by 24.45. And we get the molarity is equal to 8.18 times 10 to the minus 4. Per 1 liter. Now we can multiply this by 2 liters. To get the units to cancel. And that is equal to. 0 0.0016 moles of solute let me take 50 grams and divide it by this number And I get three zero five six zero point three seven five uh, grams of solute per mole of solute. Okay, I got so slightly 30, different. I'm sorry, you were saying? Uh, I got thirty thousand five hundred and sixty grams of solute per mole of solute. Okay, that's fine. We just rounded off uh, differently. This came out to be quite large. Uh, but there are some biological molecules that have uh, masses that are this large. In any case, I just made these numbers up so they don't have to be realistic. All right, um, so uh, good. You figured out uh, how to do that. That's right. So notice that what we're seeing here is that if you have an unknown solute, you can use colligative properties to figure out its molar mass. We already know how we could use colligative properties how we could use boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, or vapor pressure lowering to find molar mass. Now we're seeing how we can use osmotic pressure to find molar mass. Now the hard part is, again, it's easy to measure the number of grams in the lab. The hard part is counting the number of moles. Uh, but remember, the more moles there are, the greater the osmotic pressure is going to be. And we can measure the osmotic pressure. 
that tells us the molarity directly, and then we can use arithmetic to find the number of moles. All right, that was a good method. Good. Uh, that's not an easy problem, but it didn't give you much trouble. So let's try problem four. A solution is prepared by dissolving 35 grams of hemoglobin in enough water to make up one gram, one liter of volume. And the osmotic pressure of the solution is found to be 10 millimeters of mercury at 25 degrees C. Calculate the molar mass of hemoglobin. Well, looking for the molar mass, so we want grams of solute per mole of solute. And we already know we have 50 grams of solute. And let's see, we know that the osmotic pressure is found to be 10 millimeters of mercury. Well, osmotic, I'm guessing osmotic pressure only uses atmospheres. Um, why would you say that? Because um, well, osmotic pressure is in atmospheres. Well, pressure can be measured in atmospheres or millimeters of mercury. So technically it could be measured in either. Okay, but one atmosphere is equal to 760 torr, so I'm guessing I have to convert, and one, and one millimeter mercury is equal to one torr. Okay, good. So I guess I'd have to convert that. Okay. So then, let's see, 10 millimeters of mercury is equal to 10 torr. And then multiply that by one atmosphere and divide it by 760 torr. So 10 divided by 760 is equal to 0 0.013 atmospheres. So the osmotic pressure is actually pi is equal to I M R T, where pi is equal to 0 0.013 atmospheres, and that is equal to hemoglobin, which is 1. And then M, which is, let's see, the molarity. Well, I don't know the molarity off the top of my head. Oh, and we don't have 50 grams. We have 35 grams of solute. In this case, it's hemoglobin, so looking for M and then R is 0 0.082 liters atmosphere mole Kelvin and times that by let's see 298.15 Kelvin so 0 0.082 times 298.15 and then 0.0 And that is equal to 23.7. So divide this number by 23.71.
and then we get this number and we multiply it by, or we divide it and we get 5.55. And that's the number of moles we have. And then we can take this number of moles per one liter and multiply it by one liter. So we get the same thing. And then take this number and divide 35 grams by it. Thirty-five divided by second answer. I get sixty-three thousand sixty-nine uh, grams of solute per mole of solute. Okay, what did you get for the molarity? The molarity I got five point five four, five point five five times ten to the minus four molar. All right, I just rounded that a little bit differently. And tell me what answer did you get again? Um, my final answer is 63,069 grams of solute per mole of solute. All right. I got something different, but that's probably because I was rounding different as we went. How did you know that I was one? I'm sorry? How did you know that I was one? Because um, hemoglobin doesn't break up. That's right. How do you know that? Well, hemoglobin is a biological organic compound, covalently bonded, so we wouldn't expect it to break up. One thing you were asking me was, can we use millimeters of mercury or atmospheres why do we have to... Um, so both millimeters of mercury and atmospheres are correct units for pressure. So why do we need to use atmospheres when we plug into this equation? Because the ideal gas constant uses atmospheres. That's right. That's the way to answer that question that you asked me. The value of R that we were using, that's in terms of uh, atmospheres. Here's the value. If you write down the units, it's in terms of atmospheres and liters. So to be consistent, we need to use atmospheres. Good. They got, it, I think, a slightly different answer than both of us. But anyway, it's about 65,000. Depending on how you round off, you get slightly different answers. But they got about 65,000 like us. Does it make sense that this is so big? Why would this be big? Because hemoglobin is big. Yeah, that's right, because hemoglobin is big. So this is way bigger than the uh, value of an inorganic molecule like carbon dioxide or ammonia or something, but um, a large protein can have a mass that is this large. That's why our concentration came out so small. Uh, we have a very small concentration because um, it would take a, a pretty large mass of hemoglobin to increase the concentration because it weighs so much. All right, so that's a good example of how you might have to do a unit conversion.
Okay, let's try number one here. Normal freezing point of water is 0 degrees Celsius and its freezing point depression constant is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molo. If we make up a 1 molo solution of sodium sulfate, what is the freezing point of the mixture? Hmm. Well, we know delta. T well, we're, they're looking for the freezing point, so that would be delta, not delta, but TFF for temperature final freezing. So delta TF is equal to KF times I times little m molal. And I believe delta TF of water, sorry, not delta TF, but the KF of water is 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, I believe. 0 0.5 or 0 0.05. 0 0.5 degrees Celsius per one molal. And I guess since sodium sulfate is an ionic compound, that means it can break up into two sodium ions and one sulfate. So that would mean I is equal to 3 and molal is equal to grams of, no, sorry, moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So they give us... Oh, that's already given, 1. So that would also be 1. And they also give us a depression, which is 1.86, which is equal to all of that. So 0.5 times 3 is equal to 1.5. So 1.86 divided by 1.5 is equal to 1.24. So that would mean it would be the new freezing point would be the the original which is or sorry the initial which is 0 degrees C so TI m minus one point two four is equal to TF therefore zero degrees C minus one point two four degrees C the TF the final freezing is equal to negative one point two four degrees Celsius okay is that your answer yes alright um, you started by writing down a symbol for the question that's a good way to start it would be good by trying to get a prediction what, what, what can we predict before we start working that uh, the, the new freezing point will be lower than zero degrees Celsius. That's right. Um, then you wrote down this equation. Let's see. What did you plug in? Uh, tell me, what, what was the original equation you wrote down? Delta TF mm -hmm. is equal to KF times I times M. Good. Little m. What did you plug in for KF? 0 0.5. Where did you get that from? Uh, you, I believe you gave it to me before. So you're kind of relying on memory there. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, uh, what does the symbol stand for? It's the, it's the freezing point constant. That's right. Now, I did give you 0.5 before, but that is the boiling point elevation constant. Oh. Huh. Now, you don't actually have to look this up in your notes. All the information that we need is given in the problem. Oh, then instead it's it's not 0.5, it's just 0 degrees Celsius. Take a little bit more time on that. Um, how, where does the problem tell us what to plug in for KF? Hmm. 
the normal freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. Oh, wait a minute. We're, we're trying to figure... We don't know that. Oh, it's 1.86. Yeah. What's the name of this symbol? Freezing point depression constant. That's right. But I think you were, you were reaching for the wrong numbers uh, in the problem here. So there was some confusion with the first time we did this. Uh, yeah. So what should we plug in for KF? 1.86 degrees C per molo. Right. Okay. And I think that led you to some other confusions as well. So maybe we should back up and do this problem again. So let's try again. What are you going to plug in for these variables? 1.86 for KF, 3 for I, and 1 for M. But we're still trying to figure out the new final temperature. So 1.86 times 3 is equal to 5.58. So delta TF is equal to 5.58. And since the freezing point is going to be lower, that would mean the original 0 degrees C minus 5.58 the initial 0 degrees C minus 5.5 will give us temperature final freezing, which is negative 5.58 degrees C. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, so the first time through, um, we got a little confused about KF. So this problem, uh, when you take the test, I don't think they're going to expect you to have any of the constants memorized. All the information you need will be given to you. Um, so there is a 0.5 constant for water, but that's the boiling point constant. Here we want to plug in the freezing point. Um, I think when you did this the first time, you were also plugging in a number for delta T. It sounded like you were plugging in 1.86 for delta T. It sounded like you ended up with an equation with no variables in it, uh, which uh, would, would mean we made a mistake. So this is the right way to do it. Um, so how do you interpret this 1.86? What does this 1.86 tell us? Well, for, for every one molal unit of solution, the temperature is going to decrease by 1.86 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Whose temperature? Uh, who's temperature? The, the solution, or the, the molal solution of sodium sulfate. Let's actually try that one more. Yeah, try that one more time. So again, say in words, what does this tell us? For every one molal solution of sodium sulfate, mm -hmm. the freezing point is is going to decrease by one point eight six degrees. Okay. Yes. Now let's clarify that a little. First of all, this says if we add one molal, it doesn't. Maybe we shouldn't say we're adding one molal of solution. We're adding one molal of solute. This is the constant concentration of the solute. If we add one molal of solute, and instead of, we shouldn't focus on the sodium sulfate, because remember, this is a colligative property. It doesn't depend on the solute. This is a property of who? This is a property of water. So what we should be saying is when we add one molal of solute to water, the freezing point of water decreases by 1.86 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, for a second there, it seems like you were maybe confusing this with the freezing point of water. So KF is not the freezing point of water, it's the freezing point depression constant, which is a more complicated idea. Uh, it's good that you saw that this would break up into three ions. We haven't done any many, many problems where I was three. Okay, that would be a good problem to mark and go back and try again, because I think we missed that uh, the first time. So let's try number two. For a 0 0.222 molal aqueous solution of sucrose, what is the boiling point where the boiling point elevation constant is 0 0.12? Okay. So what is the new boiling point that way? We're looking for TBF, temperature, the final temperature boiling point. And we know delta TB is equal to KB times M times I where I is 1, M is 0 0.222, and KB is 0 0.512 degrees Celsius. So 0 0.512 times 0 0.222. Delta TB is equal to 
zero point one one three six six four. Well, actually, we're not looking for TBF. They're just asking what is the the boiling point. So the the boiling point. Well, I get. Well, I'm assuming they're using water. So water boils at 100 degrees C. So 100 plus. This answer would mean that it boils at 100.11 degrees Celsius. So what's your answer? 100.11 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what would be a good symbol for what this question is asking? Delta, no sorry, not delta, um, TBF. Then you plugged in the equation. How did you know that I was 1? Because uh, sucrose is a non-electrolyte. That's right. And we had the 0.512 and the 0.222. Good. And what's the clue word that tells us that we that this that the solvent is water? Aqueous. That's right. I think you were saying that you had to assume it's water, but they actually tell us that it's water by saying that it's an aqueous uh, solution. Then it sounded like you weren't quite sure for a second whether they were asking for the change in the boiling point or the new boiling point, but it looks like you worked that out. Um, it should be uh, the new boiling point. So we should be uh, adding here the 100 plus this. Uh, so this comes out to be uh, about uh, right. Good. Okay. And then how would we interpret this? What does this tell us? Oh, that is a um, boiling point elevation constant for water. So how would we interpret this number 0. 0.512 in words? So for every one um, mole so, uh, solution, the, the boiling point of water will increase by 0. 0.512 degrees Celsius. Good. The only problem there is, instead of saying that it's one molal of solution, it's probably better to say one molal of solute, because this is measuring the concentration of the solute in the solution. This problem is a little different than the ones we've done before, but let's see if we can figure out uh, what they're going for here. How would you work this out? 10 grams of sodium chloride in 200 grams of water. What is the mass percent? Well, I'm guessing they just mean the mole fraction. So 10 grams of NaCl. Divide that by, what is it, 23 plus 35.45. That's 58. 0.45 grams per one mole. Oh, and they would probably, you would probably want to look for X, the mole fraction of, of uh, the solute. So 10 divided by 58.45, that gives us 0 0.17. Okay. Now, it sounds like what you're saying is that the mole fraction is pretty close to the mole percent. So that must be what they're asking. But the problem... Um, is that mole percent? I thought I said mass percent. That's right. 
Yeah, so you read correctly, but I don't think you were using that in your work. So it sounds like you're on track to figure out the mole percent, but that's not what we want. We want the mass percent. So basically what you're trying to do is figure out moles, but this problem isn't about moles, it's about mass. So then in that case, I just take 10 grams plus 200 grams for a total mass, which is 210, and then I take 10 divided by 210, and that gives me 4.7% ma mass of uh, the solute. What does this mean? This means that 4.8% of the mass comes from sodium chloride. This would mean that 4.8% of the mass comes from sodium chloride. So this is pretty similar to the mole fraction. Basically, we're figuring out the mass fraction. In this case, instead of figuring out the mole fraction, we're figuring out the mass fraction. There isn't really a, a symbol for that, so we can just write out as mass percent. So basically, it's just a matter of finding the percents. What percent of the total mass comes from the sodium chloride? Um, so you want to pay attention to whether we're focusing on mass or moles. Okay, let's try this. Well, we have a total of 900 grams. And we just take 100 divided by 900, and multiply it by 11, and we get 11%. So this is a new concept we haven't talked about before, mass percent. Really, I guess this is another way of measuring concentration. So we could say that 11% of the mass here is coming from glucose. So this is an alternative way of uh, measuring our concentration. So let's see how this applies to the problems. Um, Let's see. Okay, this problem is a little tricky. I think we need a new trick. So uh, let's work on this together. What would be a good symbol for what this question is asking? T. 
CB. Good. The initial boiling point or the final boiling point? I guess the, the initial. Well, what do we mean when we say initial or final? What's the difference between the initial and the final point? The initial boiling point is what we're calling the boiling point without any solute. And the final boiling point is the boiling point after you've added the solute. So in this case, do you think they're asking for the boiling point of the pure solvent or with the solute? With the solute, so it'd be final. Right, because they said the boiling point of the solution. Uh, good. What might be a good equation to use on this problem? Uh, delta T uh, B is equal to KB times M times I. Actually, no. Wait a minute. Um. That, that, that is a good equation. Should this be capital M or little m? Little m. Now, do we know any numbers we can plug in here? What would we plug in for KB? It would be um, 0.512. I didn't actually give you the KB on this problem, but in previous problems, we've seen that that's the KB of water. Actually, just uh, 0 0.52. 0 0.52. And what could we plug in for I? 2. Good. So what we have left is we need to find uh, the molality. All right, and now we, get, we need a trick. I'll just tell you the trick. The trick is let's assume we have 100 grams of solution. Let's just assume that. That doesn't mean we really have that, but let's assume we have 100 grams of solution. Now that now we've made that assumption, see if you can solve the problem. So if we have 100 grams of solution, the mass percent is 20, so... That would mean that we would have 20 grams, because 100 grams total, that would mean that times 20%, well, that would mean that we have 20 grams of NaCl and 80 grams of water. So then 20 grams of NaCl divided by 58.45 grams per one mole. And that is equal to 0 0.34. And then we can take 80 grams and divide it by 1,000 grams to get kilograms. And we get 0 0.08 kilograms of water. So we just take 0.342172797.3 divided by 0 0.08. And then the molality then is equal to 4. Two seven, so four point three. Then we just plug this into our equation. So delta T B is equal to zero point five two degrees C times four point three times two. So point five two times four point three times two. And that is equal to 4.5. So since water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees plus that answer, that would mean that it now boils at 104.5 degrees. Is that your answer? Yeah. Okay. So there's one more type of problem you might see on the test that we've learned how to do. Um, so here we had to learn this new concept of mass percent. So here was a trick that most people wouldn't think of on their own. Notice that there was no that we couldn't find the molality here 
until we assumed a specific number. Actually, you could find the molality without assuming a specific number, but it becomes more complicated algebra. So it really helps to assume a number. Now, do we, does this mean we really have 100 grams? Well, no, but the point is you, you can tr experiment with this. Suppose that you assumed that you had 200 grams. If you actually do that, you'll see you still get the same answer. Or assume that you have 300 grams. If you do that, you'll see that you still get the same answer for the molality. It turns out that it doesn't matter what we assume as the number of grams, we're always going to get the same molality, which means we can assume whatever is convenient. Why was it convenient to assume 100 grams? It's just an easy number. Easy to take percents of, yeah. All right, so um, now this is a tricky, um, this is tricky. You, um, you can't just go around assuming numbers willy-nilly on problems. You can only assume a number when, it doesn't, when, the number, when the exact number doesn't actually affect the answer. Uh, how can you tell whether it affects the answer? The only way to know for sure really would be to do the problem all over again using 200 grams. Uh, I won't do that with you, but if you do it again with 200 grams, you'll see you get the same answer. But anyway, we can just memorize that for this particular type of mass percent problem, since they didn't give us any of the actual masses, we can just assume a convenient number and we're going to be able to, uh, to get an answer. Okay, um, so that is a new method uh, for this type of problem. Good. Try this. Well, okay, well, we have. We have 30 grams of glucose, since we can assume 100 grams, I'll divide that by 180 to get the moles of glucose, and since we have 70 grams, can divide that by 1,000 to get 0 0.7 kilograms. So then we take 0 0.16, divide that by 0 0.07, and then we'll get... 2.28 molar. So then we can just take delta TF is equal to 2.53 times 2.28 times 1. That is equal to 5.7. Six eight four, and since freezing is zero degrees C, subtract that from zero, and then our new our final temperature is equal to negative five point seven six eight four degrees Celsius.
Okay, you're way ahead of me. Let me check to make sure that's right. So how many moles of glucose did you say that you had? Well, we have 30 grams, and we divide it by 180, which is the Good. molecular weight, and I get 0 0.16. Or 0.17, really, uh, moles of glucose. And then you found the molality was 0.17 moles of glucose. And then we need the kilograms. Now, should we put kilograms of solution or kilograms of solvent? Kilograms of solvent. That's just something that's the definition of molality. So we need to have that memorized. So I think you put 0 0.07 kilograms of water here because you convert it into kilograms. So 0.17 divided by... So what did you get for the molality? Two point two eight. Hmm. You must have rounded uh, a lot differently than me. All right. You did point one seven divided by point oh seven. Yeah. And you got two point. I I got point one six divided by point oh seven. Oh okay. Really, if you were rounding off, you should round to point one seven. All right. Anyway, I got point two point four. Close enough. Uh, so that would be our molality. And then you have uh, your equation, delta T, B, I, M, K, F. So that was, glucose has an I of 1, and this was 2.4, and you were given the K, F, 2.53. Oh, I screwed up. All right, so what did you get for the delta T? Uh, delta T is equal to 5.77. All right, I got something a lot different. I guess we were rounding a lot different. I got 6.072. 1 times 2.4 times 2.53. All right, um, and then how did you find the, foil the, the final boiling point? The final boiling point? I mean the filing, final freezing point. Um, the final freezing point, well, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Now, there's so there's a mistake in what you just said. Sorry, it, it, it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Right. That's still actually a mistake for this problem. Oh, no, it actually... Hmm. Because what's the solvent in this problem? Oh, benzene. Benzene. So that's partly my mistake. Um, so really, there isn't enough information to answer this. I should have told you, what's the missing information that you need? Benzene's freezing point. Yeah, you need to know the freezing point of benzene. So there wasn't enough information. Freezing point of pure benzene. There's a table in your textbook that gives the freezing points. So you can look that up but it looks like it's 5.5 degrees Celsius. So now what calculation would you do to find the answer? So then 5.5 minus 5.76 A4 and Well, since it freezes at 5.5, we subtract 5.76, and we get negative 0.26, so negative 0.27 okay. degrees Celsius. Good. Now, for some reason, my numbers came out different. I don't know if one of us made a calculator mistake or we're just rounding differently. But anyway, I would do 5.5 minus 6.072, and then I would get this answer. Okay. Um... So in this problem, you assumed 100 grams. 100 grams of what? Total mass. Total mass for what? Of glucose and benzene. Yeah, what's the name of that? That's the solution. So one thing that's important here is we're not assuming 100 grams of solvent. We're assuming 100 grams of solution because that makes it easier to take percents. This is 30% of the total solution, not just of the solvent. So it's good to label it like this. This is... 100 grams of solution. All right.
Well, let's try number four. Automotive antifeeze consists of ethylene glycol and non-volatile non-electrolyte. Calculate the boiling point and freezing point of a 25 mass percent solution of ethylene glycol in water. So they want both the boiling point and the freezing point. So I guess we'll work on the boiling point first. Delta TB is equal to KB times M times I. KB for water, I guess in this case, is going to be... I'll just don't give it, I'll just say 0 0.5 degrees C. And since we are assuming 25% mass, we can assume 100 grams. So 25 grams of ethylene glycol. And then 75 grams of water. So 75 grams is 0 0.075 kilograms of water. And then 100 grams. That's 24 plus 32 plus 6. 100 grams divided by 62 grams per 1 mole. That is equal to 1.613 moles. So take 1.613 moles. Divide that by 0 0.075 kilograms. That is equal to 21.51 molar. So delta TB is equal to 0 0.5 degrees C. I'm going to interrupt here. So you had to do a unit conversion to figure out how many moles of ethylene glycol you have. What did you write down to do that? What, what exactly did you write down to do that unit conversion? You were converting... Oops. Mm -hmm. I put 100 grams. It should be 25. That's right. Okay. So 25 divided by 62 is actually 0 0.403 moles. So 0 0.403 divided by 0 0.075 that is equal to 5.73 moles or molal. Zero point five times five point seven three molal times one. That is equal to two point eight six five. And since water boils at a hundred degrees, take a hundred plus that. So the new boiling point will be 102.865 and delta TF is equal to 1.0. I don't remember what it was for water. You can get that from problem one here. Or we're doing boiling point. Uh, oh, yeah. If you take a look at problem one that we did before, you might have the information you need. Oh, 1.86. So delta TF is equal to 1.86 degrees C times 5.73 molo times 1. And that is equal to 10.6578. So 0 degrees C minus 
ten point six five seven eight. So the new, so the final one. It's equal to negative 10.6578 degrees C. What what answer did you get there again? Negative um 10.65 degrees Celsius. All right, so what would be a good symbol for what this question is asking us? Delta, um, or not, sorry, not delta, TFB and TFF. Final boiling point, final freezing point. What did you get for the molality of the solute? Five point seven three molal. I think you might have miswritten that. I got 5.373. Maybe there's a rounding mistake, but you might have also left out that 3 there. So let's see here. We had uh, 0.403 divided by 0 0.05. So you might, you might have had uh, a mistake there. All right, so anyway, um, I got 5.37. Oh, yeah, you're right. So then what do you get for delta TB? Two point six eight. Good. I round that off to two point six nine. So what's T final be? One hundred two point six nine. And the units are uh, degrees Celsius. Good. Um, and now, what do you get for delta T final? Well, so exact approximately nine point nine nine. So that's ten. So the new one will be negative 10 degrees Celsius. Let's see. The delta TF is 9.99. Okay. And 0 degrees minus 10 basically is negative 10 degrees Celsius. Good. I got slightly different answers in the answer key. But um, I guess that's uh, rounding errors again. The rounding errors seem to make a, a big difference on these problems. I think we did that correctly. Okay, um, so this is an example of how to do a problem that involves uh, mass percents, um, which is something else that you might see on the test. We use this uh, assuming uh, technique. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you.